This episode of the Creep Street Podcast is brought to you by Martini Coffee Roasters. You know, people always look at me weird when I say I start off every morning with a big old martini. But then I set them straight and I tell them I'm talking about Martini Coffee Roasters Coffee. A delicious coffee made by the Martini family. They roast their coffee using a traditional method of sight and sound to roast those little babies to perfection. And they also sell green coffee beans for those home roasters out there. And right now, fans of the Creep Street podcast can get 20% off their entire order by using the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Once again, for 20% off your order, use the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Martini Coffee Roasters, the perfect coffee to keep you creeps caffeinated. You've taken a wrong turn down Creep Street. Citizens of the Milky Way, this is Maureen Bogey. And this is Dylan Hackworth. And you are listening to the Creep Street Podcast. Ooh, there's a nip in the air, folks. And it's not just... It's not just because there's specters all around us. It's because we are entering the holiday season. We sure are. It has begun. Officially. Oh my gosh. This is the first episode of December. And my gosh, I think we have a holly jolly December prepared. I think you guys are going to like it. I'm really excited to start off the holiday season going for it, going for it, Horde. Yeah, and we're going to kick it off with a wacky weird one. I'm excited. Now to be kept up on what we're doing, feel free to follow us on Instagram at Creep Street Podcast, Twitter we're at Creep Street Pod. We also have a Facebook, and on our Facebook we have a subgroup called Citizens of the Milky Way, okay? And that is just a great forum where anyone can post anything, react to anything. We've got memes, articles, short stories, people can ask questions, anything like that. We've got it, all sorts of stuff going on at Citizens of the Milky Way, a Creep Street fan page. Oh, yes, baby. Yes. So we recommend you check that out. And here's the thing. We know that one episode a week is just, it's not enough. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Is taking one breath a week enough? Didn't think so. No. Creep Street is similar to breathing in so far as that it gives you life. Absolutely. It keeps you alive. It keeps the blood pumping. Mm -hmm. Now, you can get more than one episode a week if you go to patreon.com slash creepstreetpodcast. Oh, yeah. Okay? There you can get all sorts of great bonus content. We're talking movie reviews. We're talking movie commentaries. We're talking movie rankings. We're talking short stories. We're talking full bonus episodes and anything and everything in between. Yes, we just put up a couple days ago a feature comedy where we did a watch along with the first Paranormal Activity movie. Such a blast. Such a blast. If you like little goodies like that, it, you know, everything, like I said, we do bonus episodes, but also we like to, we'll watch a movie and record a commentary that you can just sync up with the movie at home. And it's like you're watching a movie with us. Yeah, it's just fun. It's a blast. Just fun stuff like that that we have. You can check that out once again at patreon.com slash creepstreetpodcast. We have a $2 tier, a $5 tier, and a $10 tier. So whatever your budget is, we've got you covered. And a Patreon subscription is actually a great gift. Amen. So keep that in mind for your gift giving this holiday season. Also, we are preparing for our listener stories episode. Mm, yes, I love these. It comes twice a year. Mm-hmm. Yes, as some of you may know, we, we do a Creep Street listener stories episode twice a year, once in the summertime and once around Christmas time. Yes. Yes. And we really hope you enjoy these episodes. We love making these episodes. So we're preparing for our next one. So please reach out to us on any of our social media accounts. You can DM us there or you can email us at creepstreetpodcast at gmail.com and give us your stories, your paranormal experiences, your connection 
to true crime in your town, maybe an urban legend from your town. Yes. Anything like this, we want to hear about it. So you can let us know those, once again, DM us on our socials, or you can email us at creepstreetpodcast at gmail.com. Um, now, last week, we kind of went for, we kind of went for it. You know, we did a big topic. We did the Grim Reaper. That's right. Something for the American holiday. Just a little, uh, little treat for you. Yeah. And, you know, we've, you know, received good feedback on that episode. So thank you all so much for listening to that. And if you haven't listened to it yet, you know, maybe go, go ahead and listen to that next. But this week, we have something a little different up our sleeves. Oh, God, do we ever. Maureen, this is weird. Okay. This really plays into a subject, into a theme we encounter a lot, is perhaps this is all related. UFOs, the paranormal, sure. cryptids, maybe they're all related. Hell yeah. This is drenched in that. Okay. 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 Citizens of the Milky Way, this week's episode is The Paranormal Abduction of Brian Scott... All right, let me deck these halls with my sources. Please do. This is exciting stuff. I'm I'm excited to see what this episode is going to be all about. Oh, I think you're going to like it and love it. Folks, uh, here are my sources. An article called Alien Abductions, Poltergeist Activity, Possession, and the Bizarre Case of Brian Scott by Brent Swanser at Mysterious Universe. The Brian Scott Abduction Files by Marcus Louth at UFO Insight. And the alien contactee Edward Meyer and his controversial UFO photos by Brent Swanser at Mysterious Universe. Whoa, okay, okay. This one, when I came across it, I was very excited to share because like I said, it dives into that theme that this is all connected. Mm, mm-hmm. This at its core is a UFO abduction story, but if you are more, if UFOs aren't really your thing, if you're more of a bump in the night, a haunted house thing, Stick around, because this is for you as well. Oh, wow. This contains many phenomena associated with all sorts of things. We talk about psychic abilities, poltergeists, etc. The story truly spans the spectrum of what we cover here on the show, and it all concerns a man named Brian Scott, who had several encounters throughout his lifetime. And many witnesses would even report seeing miraculous things happening while in his presence. For those who hang out in esoteric circles, they believe that what many think are alien abductions are actually visits from entities from the spirit world. Hmm. Okay, 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 okay. Well, it all began on Brian Scott's 16th birthday. It was the night of October 12th, 1959. After celebrating his birthday that evening, Brian was walking home with his dog when suddenly what seemed to be an orange ball of light appeared from out of nowhere. Brian described this ball of light as being less than a foot in diameter, and if that wasn't weird enough, this ball seemed to hover directly above his dog's head. Hmm. Brian gazed at the strange orb in disbelief, and he said the longer he looked at it, it seemed as though the ball was semi-solid, as if the middle of the orb was more sturdy than its outer shell. Oh, Weird, okay. Well, Brian stared at this ball in amazement, when suddenly it moved away from his dog's head and hovered directly in front of his face. A few moments later, the strange ball of light shot upward and vanished into the sky without a trace, leaving Brian and his dog standing there in stunned silence. Brian couldn't help but get the feeling that this thing was trying to communicate with him somehow. He claimed that strange thoughts and images appeared in his mind and that he believes these images and thoughts did not come from him, that it was as if this ball of light was communicating with him telepathically. It wouldn't be for another 12 years that Brian would have his next experience. So already starting off with orbs, strange orbs. Now this has been in so many things, whether it's Skinwalker Ranch, you name it, Mm -hmm. these orbs of light show up. Yeah, and you know, kind of like you said, it's it can represent so many different things or it can be representative of so many different things. Right. You hear about these a lot with ghost encounters, but you also hear about orbs of light with UFO encounters. Amen, sister. Now we jump forward to March 14th, of 1971. Brian was with his friend Nick Corbin that evening, and that evening both of them had this strange feeling that they should go for a hike in the Superstition Mountains, which are located just outside Phoenix, Arizona. He lived in Arizona, obviously. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to find a place to do some target shooting, but they just, they couldn't understand why they just suddenly had this urge to drive, you know, about an hour away to, you know, go hiking and do some target shooting. 
So the two men are just driving through the Superstition Mountains when all of a sudden, Brian had the urge to pull the car over, which they did. Both men got out of the car and both of them had a strange feeling that something was about to happen. They scanned the skyline looking and waiting. That's when they noticed what seemed to be some sort of an aerial craft in the sky. The best Brian could describe the craft was being a sort of oval shaped and it glowed from its underside with a sort of purple light. Hmm. The craft seemed to be moving towards them and immediately both men had the urge to turn and run, but before they could, something strange happened. Before they could turn to run, their bodies were seized by a strange sort of pulling feeling. The next thing Brian remembers, he was being engulfed in a beam of light and the feeling that his body was being lifted off the ground. According to Brian, his ascension up into the craft was very swift. He could feel the warm Arizona air on his skin, but also what felt like a cold energy that was coming from the craft. He briefly caught a glimpse of the city lights of Phoenix, and the next thing he knew, he was inside the spacecraft. Whoa. Yeah. We're going right to from zero to 60. Yeah, okay, whoa. Of the many things racing through Brian's mind, he was also surprised to find that his friend Nick had also been transported on board this ship as well, so he wasn't there alone. Of course, wildly afraid and confused, Brian and Nick had found themselves in what seemed to be a small room. Moments later, according to Brian, the room began to fill with a sort of strange mist or fog. Moments passed as the room filled with this fog when, to their horror, figures began to emerge in the mist. How Brian would describe them was absolutely horrifying. Before them were four or five creatures standing about seven feet tall. Their skin was gray and reptilian-like, and what Brian described as a sort of thick patch or hide on their torso area. The creatures, he claimed, did have thumbs, but then also three long, terrifying claws on each hand. He would later describe them as being like a combination of many earth animals, like a chimera. Oh, weird. Very interesting. Now, we're going to get into this image later. It's very fascinating. Next, both men were led into separate rooms. Brian describes it almost as if he were floating into another room. He isn't sure if that's exactly what happened, but it was a sensation that he was being carried somewhere without being physically touched. Once separated, both men had their clothes removed. Brian describes being pressed against a wall as if by an invisible force. It was like he was held by restraints that he couldn't see. The next thing Brian noticed was a pole that ran up from the floor and into the ceiling. And on this pole was a box. And from this box emitted what Brian described as an intense beam of light. One of these weird creatures stood by the box and appeared to be operating it, but without touching it. Even though his thoughts were obviously racing, Brian was able to notice that it appeared this strange mist seemed to be getting soaked into the creature's skin, like its skin was absorbing the mist around it. Oh. Okay. The box was lowered to the floor and this beam of light started at his feet. It was as if it was examining Brian's body. He described the sensation as being like a combination of both warm and cold water running over and within his body. The beam gradually moved up his body, seeming to examinate it as it went. But then the light reached his eyes. And when it did, Brian was immediately hit with an awful headache. Simultaneously, though, Brian felt what my source describes as, quote, a strange numbing grip on his mind. Suddenly, the light went out, and the creature left the room. But barely a moment later, another creature entered, and this one was taller than the rest, probably about nine feet tall. Silently, the creature made its way over to Brian, who was still restrained to the wall. It then reached out and touched Brian's head, and immediately... Brian claims his mind was rushed with thousands of thoughts all at once. Damn. Brian outright asked the creature who they were and what they wanted with him and his friend. The response he got was something he couldn't understand. It sounded jumbled and very quick. But a moment later, it responded again, slower this time, and in crystal clear English. It said, There will be no pain in this. And as the creature uttered these words, Brian claims any ounce of pain that he might have felt in his body was suddenly gone. Amazed, but still not satisfied, Brian asked again who the creatures were, to which it responded, I will tell you. I will show you. Just then, the walls of the craft almost melted away. Brian found himself surrounded by what seemed like a sort of hologram. Whatever he was seeing, it was certainly not Earth. It was a misty planet with jagged peaks 
and in the distance, deep in the fog, Brian could make out what seemed to be giant domed cities. As he viewed this, the creature explained that this was their home planet, and it explained that it had been hit with a deadly virus, and it was wiping out the population. It was an airborne virus, and that it killed many, and those that it didn't kill, it caused mutations. Furthermore, it explained to Brian that the form in which he saw the creatures was a shield against biological agents. It referred to it as a, quote, projected cloak of sorrow, meaning, you know, he sees these nine-foot things that look like a combination of animals and whatnot. It's saying that's not their real form, that it's a biological shield. Oh, I see. Interesting. What does that mean? I don't know if it means... I'm not sure if it's saying biologic in the sense that it's something that won't frighten him or if it literally means it keeps d- any diseases he might have or they might have away from each other. It keeps oh. them separated. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Inter- okay. Very fascinating. Suddenly the room became the small room again that it was, just, you know, as it was a few moments before, before it turned into this, this strange planet. The creature had turned and was leaving the room, and as it did, Brian asked again, Who are you? After saying this, the creature apparently said, quote, I lift the veil of sorrow. I am Voltar. It then shifted its form into a red-haired human being about seven feet tall with piercing blue eyes. Something obviously not as terrifying to a human as it seemed to appear very human now. Hmm. But apparently this was its true form. Oh. The creature then left the room as others entered and escorted Brian back to where he had first entered the craft. Fortunately, his friend Nick was there as well. The two men quickly put their clothes back on, and in a moment, the two were back on the ground where they were when they were taken. The men were disoriented, to say the least, and they kind of wandered about the desert where they had been, sort of getting their bearings straight, you know? Mm -hmm. They found the torch they had been carrying when they had been taken, They picked up the torch and returned to their car to see that it was just after 11 p.m., meaning they had been gone for about two hours. The men then made the drive back home, which was about an hour. Now, you would think that if you had an experience like that, you would remember it vividly. But as the men pulled up into their driveway, they suddenly noticed that their reflections of that evening were fading. Hmm. And as the night passed, all Brian could basically remember was that they witnessed a craft in the sky. Wow. It's like they can't remember too long after it actually happened. How, now, just for a side note, how they later got all this stuff was through, like, hypnosis therapy and stuff like that. Right, 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 right. Wow, what an interesting and, like, good way to protect yourself as far as the aliens go. That you just make them forget everything that happened. However they do that, I I don't know. Right, absolutely. But that's amazing. That's, wow. Oof. That's scary. Now, it would be about two years until Brian would have his next encounter with the entities, and that next experience would happen almost exactly two years later, on March 22nd, 1973. But before we get to that, right around this time is when strange things began to happen to Brian and his wife in their own home. Things that you would usually associate with hauntings or poltergeist activity. He was quoted saying, There are streaks of light. A white light just streaks its way through the house, filters, and then just goes very quickly. Then there is the ball of light itself in the house and outside the house. There have been pure flashes, as if you put a flash cube right in front of your eyeball. The light blinds you. You see it for just a few seconds, and then it disappears. There's another object, a rather odd, brown-shaped thing that has from time to time shown up. It dashes around the room in crazy directions, and every time that it does, it creates some damage to the home. All the electricity and all the circuits in the house have melted, frozen, and burned up. Interesting they both would melt, freeze, and burn up. You you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like we said, now we got weird shit going on in the house. This is a lot like Skinwalker Ranch. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's like you, it's so easy to think all these things wouldn't be connected because like poltergeist activity and alien, it, it, you just like don't automatically think that. You're you know? right. Absolutely. It's just so like, wow, crazy. What's even freakier is that his wife began to display strange behavior. She would often begin mumbling incoherently or would suddenly just faint without explanation. She would fall into trances for periods at a time where she seemed to act like a completely different person, almost as if she were possessed. 
Ooh. Yeah. Sometimes it seemed as though she would get physically assaulted by invisible hands. Things only got worse until one incident actually sent her to the hospital. Jesus. Later on in an interview with UFO researcher Timothy Beckley, Brian would further describe the incident, saying, She had been to work, pretty much handling everything that was going on around her. Then I got a call that she wasn't feeling very well. I brought her home, and after about 15 minutes of sitting there talking with her, she was saying several things, none of which made any sense to me or to her. She said that she had been in the bathroom and suddenly felt hands all over her body. It was as if someone had broken into the house and molested her. When she calmed down and started making explanations to me about what the hell was wrong with her, it was as if, from her description, the aliens I had seen aboard the craft in 1971 had visited her. This is odd because she has never even seen any sketches that I made of those entities. Later that evening, it seemed as if she was okay. I was on the phone and the baby was getting into everything so I couldn't carry on the conversation. I got up and went looking for my wife. I heard a bumping sound and a moan coming from the bathroom. My wife was on the floor, hyperventilating. I got her up and onto a chair in the living room. I was on my way to call her mother when she just fell flat on her face. I called the paramedics and while they were on the way, she got up and fell down again. Then she began to become hysterical. It took four paramedics to hold her down. She was throwing people around as if they were tissue paper. Men were thrown backward against the furniture. Finally, they loaded her up into the ambulance. I came back in the house and the baby was not in the playpen. I panicked because I couldn't find our one-year-old child. I ran back in the house. The dog was yipping at the back door. We finally found the baby sitting over in a corner of the patio. A one-year-old baby who got out of a playpen. Creepy. Very creepy. Yikes. Yikes, 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 yikes. So it's escalating. It's escalating, folks. Yeah. Oh, but that wasn't all. The family was also hearing strange disembodied voices around the house that seemed to be speaking in a language they had never heard. Objects would move around the house on their own. They would see apparitions and shadow figures lurking about. Brian describes these few figures that they would in particular see around their home. They were humanoid, with what appeared to be very frail bodies, milky white skin and large bald heads with thin lips and eerie, enormous eyes. Brian believed these were a different species of alien that he and his friend Nick had encountered back in 1971. There were also a couple other entities that Brian encountered, one referred to as The Host, and the other as Ashtar. He was quoted saying, There is one entity that comes through that calls itself The Host, whatever that means. It speaks in what sounds like some kind of computerized language. The voice seems to come out of me, an inner voice that is not mine. The entity says that I am one with it. It says, I am, I am, or you are one with me. When asked if it has a name, it will just come back and say, I am, I am. The other night, we heard some strange sounds coming from the bedroom. It began to speak in a foreign language that we later found out was Greek. Where that came from, I don't know. I wrote in Greek backward. On top of that, I was writing with my left hand, and I'm right-handed. This voice was talking. We asked who it was, and the name Ashtar came out. Then it began to use the name Ashtar and speak to my wife. It told her things about her past that only she could know. This went on for a while. Then it went on to say that it would give her all the money in the world. It only wanted one thing in return, her soul. So this is weird. So what's her soul? Like, why would an extraterrestrial give a shit about a soul? Yeah, that's very weird. Also, by the way, you know, like we said, there's, there's uh, Brian became an expert channeler, channeling these things. That's what's happening, not just mm. vocally, but also, like, writing, automatic writing. He was writing and speaking Greek, something he didn't know for, you know, right. a single thing about. Right, 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 right. But the fact that they want the soul, I find to be so weird. How creepy is that? What's yeah. we- That's so weird. That's why this really blurs the line. Like, were these even extraterrestrials in the first place? It's like, so they're just demons? Like, maybe they're interdimensional beings or something. Yeah, like, so weird. Yeah. According to Brian, one day this entity called The Host told them that it would return on Christmas Eve of 2011. More specifically, it would appear at the spider figure in the Nazca Lines. Now, the Nazca Lines, I think, has come up a couple times in past episodes. 
It's a very fascinating subject. The Nazca Lines can be found down in Peru and are an incredible archaeological mystery in their own right. And just a side note, that's a little something I want to kind of dive into more in 2023 is alternative archaeology. Oh, okay. Very fascinating stuff. I'm going to try and do a bit more of that in the coming year. It's my New Year's resolution, folks. But anyway, the host apparently told Brian that it would meet him and whoever might want to come with him at this specific site. And on top of that, it told him that they would travel to specific ancient cities where Brian and his followers would construct pyramids. So here we go. Yeah. Now we're getting into the whole ancient aliens thing. Mm-hmm. Going to ancient sites like the Nazca Lines, building pyramids and shit. This is where we're starting to walk the dang line here. Yeah. It's weird. It is very weird. Now, something Brian did often, apparently, was channel these entities, as I said, and they would speak through him. UFO and paranormal investigator Timothy Beckley was present for many of these channeling sessions. I think it was Timothy Beckley that conducted a lot of these, like, um, hypnosis therapy and stuff, Mm -hmm. where a lot of what Brian couldn't remember started to remember again, like his first encounter, all that stuff. Oh, okay. And Timothy Beckley said that when Brian was channeling, he would speak in this strange, mechanical sort of voice. Sometimes he even spoke in foreign languages. Using certain recording tools, Beckley was able to determine that when Brian was channeling, his voice would produce vocal waves at exactly 1,000 cycles. Now, I don't know what the hell this means. This was recorded using something called an oscilliography, or it's using oscilliography. I don't know what it is, some sort of a tool. I'm not, I'm, like I said, I have no idea what that means, but apparently it's considered impossible for a human to speak that way. Oh, got it. Beckley also noted that the voice, quote, lacked all harmonics and seemed to be nothing but a series of small ripples. He was also able to determine that the voice print, as it's described, was different from Brian's, which is apparently very difficult to fake. Hmm. So even if you're a person doing an impression of someone, if you watch like a vocal pattern, like recording of it, there's still ways to determine, oh, that's a person doing an impression of someone. It's right. very hard to authentically change. Not that it's impossible, but it's very hard to authentically like change your voice pattern. Mm-hmm. Even creepier is that while this voice often came from Brian, sometimes it would come from other areas of the house. The host would apparently also make various predictions while being channeled through Brian, and these things would come true. Beckley said they received this message once from The Voice in one of these channeling sessions. Of the host, open run one. From the sky now comes a ball of fire for all mankind to see. Of this, 1,000 particles. Of this, I am, I am. Look to the west. Given in trust, latitude 3801, north longitude 11950 west. Of this, seek of I. Of this, he asked of I. A sign, given. So it seems like we're getting some coordinates, right? Mm -hmm. It seems a little jumbled, but we're able to determine these are some coordinates. Well, all of that seems like kind of just jumbled nonsense until about 20 hours later, when a ball of fiery light was seen streaking across the skies of Canada and Mexico, shooting off sparks and particles as it went. One of these particles would apparently land right at the coordinates that the host had told them earlier. In Beckley's research of Brian, he also witnessed him conducting automatic writing and even constructing diagrams of advanced science and technology. Brian would even claim that these entities had tasked him with, quote, mastering quantum displacement physics and begin to develop a mind transference machine to unite all of humanity. Once again, sounds a bit jumbly, but hey. Yeah, yeah, don't really, yeah, interesting though, okay, okay. Once Brian even traveled to, and forgive me if I say this wrong, Tijuanaco in Bolivia on the instruction of these entities. When he returned home, Brian was said to be much calmer and in possession of strange knowledge. He even quit smoking. Oh. He also returned with the ability to move objects with his mind and even read the minds of others. So now we're even getting sort of like psychic abilities now. Yeah. Like I said, this is a little of everything. Everything all cracked up into one big old omelet. You got psychic abilities, you've got UFO abductions, you've got poltergeist activity, and apparently something that wants his wife's soul. Like, that sounds more like a haunting, like mm-hmm. a demonic thing, you know what I mean? Right, yeah. Now, what is interesting is that this foreign language that Brian would sometimes unexplainably speak, as we said, he would speak and write in it, was Greek. And that is very interesting because ancient Greek is often associated with the UFO phenomenon in many ways. Oh. For example... Photos have surfaced that claim to be authentic photos of wreckage from the 1947 crash out near Roswell. 
that are said to depict ancient Greek writing on them, which leads many to wonder if these extraterrestrials are actually not ancient humans like Atlanteans. These kinds of ET connections are not new to the UFO phenomena. And that's where I'm going to introduce you to another character that kind of complements Brian's story. There are countless other examples that we could cover, but one we can sort of pair with Brian's is that of Eduardo Meyer, who often went by the name Billy, so I'll call him Billy in this, but Billy was born in Switzerland in 1937, and he began to have strange experiences from a young age. In 1942, when Billy was just five years old, he claimed he met a man named Svoth, spelled S-F-A-T-H, Svoth. Yes, Svoth. Well, Svoth claimed to be part of a race of extraterrestrials called the Palladians from the Palladian Star Cluster. And just like Brian, Billy would also claim to be in repeated contact with these entities through channeling. Most of the time, he would be communicating with a woman named Askent. They would teach him of their culture and customs and what life was like where they were from. He said that they instructed him with the intention that he would be influential in getting humanity back on track. These encounters would continue until one day in 1964, they abruptly stopped. This wouldn't be the end of it, though, as over a decade later in 1975, Billy claimed he was once again contacted by the Palladians. This time, he was contacted by a Palladian woman named Semjace, who said she was the granddaughter of the first Palladian who contacted him, Svoth. These encounters would inspire Billy to form a program called the Free Community of Interest for the Broader and Spiritual Sciences and UFO Studies. Brian claimed that these ETs came to trust him more and that they would allow him to even photograph them and also what they called their beam ships, or at least that's what Billy referred to them as, their craft. He was even able to photograph these ETs as well as their machines and apparently was, had even taken photos in distant worlds and even the ancient past. Some of these photos have actually become quite famous. For example, in the first three seasons of The X-Files, we see Agent Mulder's poster of a flying saucer that reads, I want to believe. Mm-hmm. It's iconic, right? Oh, yeah. Well, that photo was taken by Billy. But starting in the fourth season, they actually used a different image due to a copyright issue. I guess they hadn't got permission to use that photo. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so that's interesting. Now, it must be stated that the validity of Billy's photos has always been in question as they seem just a little too clear to be real. Billy's credibility took a huge blow in 1997 when his wife confessed that Billy had made UFO models for taking pictures of and that the image of these so-called ETs were actually two women named Michelle Delafave and Susan Lund. These two women were members of the singing and dancing group called the Gold Diggers. Oh! And this was indeed later verified. Billy's group was also facing increasing criticism that his UFO group was actually more like a creepy UFO cult. Oh. Especially when Billy began to claim that he himself was a prophet in the lineage of those written about in the Abrahamic religions. Yeah, that, that checks out. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, you know. It's, the yeah. whole, the squad. Starts getting a little, starts getting dicey when you start claiming you're a, a prophet from God. You know mm, what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. But even today, Billy Meyer has his defenders. His defenders claim that the photos were manipulated to look fake as part of a government agenda of discrediting UFO contactees. In a pamphlet titled The Truth About Billy Meyer, it reads, UFO contact person Billy Meyer is often attacked by uninformed people who do not have the slightest knowledge of Billy's comprehensive contacts and his mission and all the details. They have never even met Billy in person. Uninformed critics and untrustworthy people who feel Billy's contacts and mission are impossible discredit and accuse him of being a charlatan or worse and try to ridicule him. However, generally speaking, they are ill-informed on the issues and context and therefore are in no position to pass any realistic and competent judgment on the mission, the contacts, or Billy's person. Billy did not strive for these contacts with extraterrestrials. On the contrary, he was sought out by the Palladians because of an ancient mission from thousands of years ago. Furthermore, it has been shown that Billy did not agree to these contacts for financial gain, publicity, or personal fame, which can be evidenced by his withdrawn lifestyle. Many people still claim that Billy faked the hundreds of UFO photos he has taken to achieve some form of personal fame and or monetary gain for himself, despite the positive analysis performed by several competent scientists and photo experts. In particular, they seem to be people who, because of some strange opinions concerning the rest of the world, politics, or religion, cannot bear the truth that may differ from their own beliefs. 
They are willing to suppress the truth with the aid of mean, dishonest methods and to extinguish it, if possible, even if it means going over dead bodies, tarnishing and destroying the reputation of another human being. Most of these allegations are not even backed up by scientific research, or they contain false, distorted facts. In addition, it is a known fact that numerous photos of Billy's were carefully manipulated in the past to show strings and similar anomalies and were widely distributed in attempts to discredit him. However, the decision as to their authenticity ultimately lies with each and every individual. So, who knows? Who yeah. knows about that? But UFO researcher Michael Horn is a prominent defender of Billy Meyer, and he implores people to look past the supposed evidence, saying, quote, While Meyer's evidence is certainly extraordinary, the term itself is prejudicial. Wasn't it once extraordinary to claim that the Earth moved around the sun? Testing any claims using scientific methodologies will determine the actual facts. The internet allows anyone to examine Meyer's evidence, check copyright dates, etc., and use today's state-of-the-art software, not available until decades after Meyer took his UFO photos, to analyze and authenticate his evidence. If deemed genuine, we are now confronted with the most important and unexpected discovery in science and human history. The confirmed existence of and ongoing contact with intelligent extraterrestrial life. Should that be the case, we will want to pay particular attention to the warnings they have provided about coming environmental, geopolitical, and financial events that may threaten our future survival. And I think this may be the underlying reason for the Meyer contacts. Wow. So I wanted to supplement that at the end of the Brian Scott case to show you that there's other examples of this out there. Now, Billy Meyer was largely discredited, mm -hmm. but there's many other cases like that. Uh, people yeah. who claim to have had an encounter, an abduction, but then had these strange abilities afterward. Right. Like they were given these abilities in the process. That's so Smallville. Absolutely, right? Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. so fascinating. But it, it kind of makes sense that maybe if you did have this close interaction with another life, like a, with another being, like a, with a extraterrestrial, like maybe it would have that effect on you for some reason. Right. Who knows? I don't know. Or is it something that they're doing to us? Right. I don't know. Yeah. Well, folks, that's going to wrap it up for the paranormal abduction of Brian Scott. What a weird cuckoo kachu friggin' story. It, absolutely wild, right? I, yeah. It was a great way to start off December. It's so weird. Yeah. So weird. I agree. So bizarre. Well, Dylan, thank you so much for doing all of that fantastic research. We are so grateful that you did it. And what a weird app. Well, it was my pleasure. And I'll tell you what, I got a list of names I wouldn't mind sucking me up into a spacecraft. Okay. Folks, the names of our top tier Patreon subscribers, of course, the Dream James Watkins, the Finnish Face Viet Lungfist, the Madman Marcus Hall, the Vivacious Vicky McHugh, the Tenacious Teresa Hackworth, the Heartbreak Kid Chris Hackworth, the Oh So Suave Sean Richardson, the British Bone Breaker Bex Martin, the Notorious Nicholas Barker, the Terrifying Taylor Lashmet, the Count of Cool Cameron Corliss, the Archduke of Attitude Adam Archer, the Sinister Sam Kiker, the Nightmare of New Zealand Noeline Vavilli, the Loathsome Johnny Love, the Carnivorous Kevin Bogey, the Killer Stud Carl Staub, the Firestarter Heather Carter, the Conqueror, Christopher Damien Damaris, the Awfully Awesome Annie, the Murderous Maggie Leach, the Sir of Sexy Sam Hackworth, the Evil Elizabeth Riley, Lauren Hellfire, Hernandez Lopez, the Maniacal Laura Maynard, the Vicious Karen Van Buren, the Arch Nemesis Aaron Bird, the Sadistic Sergio Castillo, the Rap Scallion Ryan Crum, the Beast Benjamin Huang, the Devilish Chris Doucette, the Psycho Sam, the Electric Emily Jeong, the Ghoulish Gert Hankum, the Renegade Corey Ramos, the Crazed Carlos, and the Antagonist Andrew Paul. Thank you so much to all of our top tier Patreon subscribers. We couldn't do this without you, and we are so grateful to have you with us. Thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers and to all of you for listening to us today. We love making the show for you. We are so happy that you're here. And if you could like, rate, subscribe, tell a friend about us, leave a review, anything like that, it really helps out the show, and it's a great way to tell us you're liking what you're what you're hearing absolutely and once again get in those listener stories yes please get in those listener stories as soon as you can we would love to have you have your story on the show Ooh, that's right let's enjoy this holiday season together shall we okay citizens of the milky way my name is dylan hackworth i'm maureen bogey good night and goodbye